Thank you very much for, for coming. Um, I'm Dan Fagan. I'm the uh, director of the Science, Health, and Environmental Reporting Program here at the Arthur L. Carter Journalism Institute, which is where you're at right now. Today, we're doing something I've really been looking forward to, uh, and that is welcoming Ben Lilly, who is a really interesting guy who is doing something really interesting and new. He's sort of a classic example of, of somebody who saw a niche and uh, is filling it in a, in a really interesting and useful and fun way. And as uh, Lee will tell us, he's going to start uh, with a story, and so I'm really looking forward to that. So before Lee formally introduces him, I'll just say, Ben, thank you. Ben's hiding off in the wings I'm somewhere. Right you. Oh, no, he's there, okay. <laughs> he's hiding in plain sight. Uh, ben, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to Lee Hotz, who is a science writer at the Wall Street Journal, a distinguished writer in residence here at the Carter Institute. Uh, Lee, it's all yours. Professor Fagan, thank you, as always. <laughs> a moving performance, uh, I think, in keeping with our theme for this evening. So welcome um, to Inside Out. Uh, for those of you who have not joined us before, this is an evening of conversation about science journalism. Uh, and what distinguishes it is uh, the guests that we're able to persuade to join us to share uh, their craft, their passions, and their labors of love. Um, and this spring, in the, in the uh, previous uh, uh, sessions and, and tonight, and as we look forward to uh, May 8th and Ed Young, we're really, we've returned to fundamentals. And we have been talking about the elements of narrative, which is, after all, the construction kit of science journalism. And this evening, we're going to look at science story as a performance art with the help of our guest, Ben Lilly. Now, some of you know him well, some of you don't. A Stanford-trained physicist, a moth story slam champion. He has a certificate in improv comedy from the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. And he is a founder of Story Collider, which you'll hear more about in a minute. He's worked with Ted. He blogs, he storifies, he curates, he produces. <laughs> he is, in fact, an exemplar of a new crew of impresarios who are orchestrating a revival of narrative performance. And personal stories of science are his forte. And we're going to begin our conversation this evening about storytelling with a story. Hello. So they asked me to, to start off here with an example of what we do. Um, and I started by making a classic staging error. I put my water over here. This was terrible. Um, there are lessons here. Always think these things through beforehand, like this. This is what not to do. I figured I'd start with a lesson like that. Apologies. So. Um, and what I actually want to do is, is say that when we do these shows and we have people tell these stories, these are, these are sort of true personal stories, um, very different from the kinds of things you normally hear. These are not lectures. These are things that happened. Um, and so normally at these kinds of events, uh, we make very, very sure whenever I'm at a venue and we're negotiating if we're going to do a show there, the first question I ask is, is there a bar? This is crucial. <laughs> um, and so what I would like you all to do is, if you aren't already, get yourself some wine, assuming you drink and get yourself in the right frame of mind. And if you don't, or you aren't far enough along, just imagine that you are. Um, and that, that will help tremendously. So I'm just gonna go ahead and start um, with that in the way I would normally start a story, which is without any filler at the top. <laughs> so apologies for that. So um, when I was uh, 11 years old, uh, my dad went on sabbatical to Ireland. Um, and that wasn't actually all that surprising. Uh, my dad had what you would call a, uh, a dad's taste in music. So we listened to exactly two things all the time, which were Joni Mitchell and Irish folk ballads. Um, so I knew all kinds of things about cockles and mussels and why the Irish hate the English, um, which they really do. And um, 
it was also a, a bit surprising uh, a place to do a sabbatical because my dad is, um, I, I apologize, there's, there's just no polite way to say this. Um, my dad is a geologist. And he's the kind of geologist where, you know, when I'm a nine, ten-year-old kid, he'll be driving down the road and all of a sudden he'll pull over and jump out of the car and go, look, look, look at that basalt formation. And I'm in the car and I write about then is when I started reading C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien and other people with lots of letters in their names and, um, you know what I meant, um, lots of letters. Um, and so I'd be reading these books and my dad would want to explain to me how the different geologic strata meant that the earth was very old and I'd be like, Aslan's dead, I need to find out what happened. Um, and this would happen ag again and again. Um, but so, okay, so he was a geologist and in particular uh, he studied mountain formation. And you all, of course, are familiar with the majestic mountains of Ireland, which is what made it a, a bit of an odd choice. But he did like the folk ballads and they have lots of pubs. So um, so uh, this happened when I was 11 years old. My parents actually had been divorced, and I was mostly living with my mom and, frankly, on a bit of an anti-parent kick all around. Um, but uh, they decided that I should go during the summer uh, and spend about a month out there with him. So I flew out, flew into Shannon. We took the bus up to, to Galway and then um, biked down. He, my dad really liked biking. I didn't, but he did. And so we... Um, we, we got on these bikes and started biking through the countryside. And the thing about Ireland uh, is that it did have mountains, but they had been worn down by the millennia into what you would call hills. And the problem with the kind of hills that come from mountains is that they're the kind of hills where you bike up them and you can see the top and you know you're going to get to the top and you get to the top and it's a flat bit and then another hill. And this keeps happening. And you're like, bike, bike, flat, oh shoot. And then you, you keep going. And I'm uh, 11 years old, not liking to bike, wanting to be reading my fantasy books. This is not an auspicious start to the trip. Um, eventually, we do reach some sort of top and go down a bit back to the sea and uh, reach a town called Spittle, which is the best name. Um, it's D's in it, but still. Um, uh, and in this town, uh, we've rented a cottage where we're going to stay, which is cute and lovely, um, except that in this cottage, there is, uh, it's heated by a peat-burning stove. Now, peat is fascinating. Um, most of you know what oil is, right? Um, duh. Uh, and the thing about oil is that the way you make it is you take a dinosaur or a forest or something like that, and you put it underground, and you compress it under enormous pressure for a very, very long time, and that gives you oil. If you do the same thing, except do a really half-assed job for not very long, what you get is peat. And so it's sort of not done. And uh, you dig it up and you stick it in a stove and it produces fire and a lot of smoke and really kind of weird smelling smoke and it's kind of yuck. And, and so this is, this is the whole trip, is, is things like this, my dad trying to explain rocks and peat and basalt and things like that, and, and strange places, and you know, we can go to the pub, and as an 11 year old, that's exciting, you can go to the pub, and then you realize that the only thing to do in the pub is watch your dad draw a smiley face in the Guinness foam, <laughs> which is exciting once. And, um, but, but. I knew it was going to be good because there was one thing that we got to do that was really exciting, which is we were going to take our bikes and go see the castles. And there's a lot of castles in Ireland. So we get on our bikes and we go out and over the days we start seeing all the castles. And I'm excited because you know there are two things that happen when you get to castles. There are orcs and fireballs. <laughs> Maybe swords, but I didn't care about those. I always liked the magic user. But um, so we, we'd bike out to these castles and the problem is that the castles there are both literally and figuratively shit. Figuratively, they are shit because castle is one word for them. Um, a better word might be tower, like just like one tower. Um, and a much better word is rubble. For the most part, they were, they were these single towers that had decayed, things had fallen down. You could sort of poke in and go, oh, there was a floor there, that's nice, um, and sort of walk around these things. Um, they were literally shit because the ones that were still standing were used as cow barns. 
So you'd walk in and there'd just be a layer of it. You're like, okay, I guess I can walk around that, maybe. Um, so, so this happened, uh, days after days, go to the pub, smiley face in the Guinness, go see another castle, not so exciting, pub, Pete, Guinness. Um, except I didn't drink the Guinness, because I was 11. Um, until, so near the end of the, near the end of the trip, uh, one day, we wake up early, and uh, we bike down, and this time we go to a ferry. And uh, we get on the ferry, and we go to Inishmore, which is one of the Aran Isles. And we get there, and we get on our bikes, and we start biking up the hill, up to the, the top of this island, and we eat some lunch, and we pass a bunch of chickens and donkeys and occasional people, and uh, get to the top of this island. And at the top, there is something called a fort. And this is different. Uh, it goes by the name of Dunangus. That's anglicized. I cannot pronounce the real name. Um, and it was built, as near as anyone can tell, in about 1000 BC. And instead of being a tower, it is three concentric rings of stone. Um, and the other thing about it is it is built on the edge of a cliff. And so you can walk over and you can sit down and look out over the ocean from this cliff in this ancient fort. And so we do this. We go and we sit down, we dangle our legs over the edge of the cliff, and we look out. And the, the coastline there is curved, and so you can actually see across and look basically at the cliff that you're sitting on. And we look at it, and it's a beautiful, it's 300 feet high, down, crashing ocean at the bottom, and all the way up, layer after layer of rock. And so my dad, of course, begins explaining to me the nature of time and the age of the Earth. Now, here's the thing about saying that the mountains of Ireland have been worn down by the millennia. Millennia is entirely the wrong word. It is far, far too short. A millennium is a thousand years. That fort was built three millennia ago. The rocks in that cliff were deposited 330 million years ago. Those mountains had been worn down by the ages and the cliffs had been made by the eons. Time is much longer than we think it is. And we sat there and my dad explained how, looking at that, James Hutton had, dis had discovered how deep time itself was. And then this had been written up by Sir Charles Lyell. Sir Charles Lyell is a knight. Knighted not for his skill with a sword, but a rock axe and not for being some magician who could hurl fireballs, but for first understanding the true depth of time. And my dad sat there explaining these things to me. It wasn't the first time he did it. It would not, by a very long stretch, be the last. But that time, as he sat there explaining it to me, and as I sat there on that cliff, behind me, a fort built before democracy, and in front of me, a cliff that had been deposited right as the first amphibians were coming onto land. That time I got it, and I started to see the wonder that he was describing. I started to see how he was trying to show the world that he saw to me. And later on, I would understand that he told that story over and over again of the centuries and the millennia and the ages and the eons. He told it in the hope that maybe just maybe that would be enough to get across one generation. Thank you. Thank you. This is a kind of stand-up. What yes. makes good science stand-up, what you just <laughs> did? Um, I'll answer the first question. Um, you know, it's funny, when, you, when we do storytelling, the kind of storytelling that we do, this is, this is a format um, sort of invented and, and honed by a group called The Moth, right? And they, they developed this format of one person on stage telling a true story from their life. Um, you're not as worried about the humor in that. Um, that's, that's not, it, 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 to a certain extent, the goal. But so uh, that sort of- No, they're kind of going for the moment where everybody cries. Yeah. 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 Um, it's very NPR, I mean. <laughs> Um, so as far as, as what comes first, it, it can be anything. For me, I'm rarely, 
I rarely have a bit of science I want to explain. For me, it's more, um, for me, I kind of cheat. Um, because I was raised by a geologist, because I was a physicist, um, if I tell an important story from my life, it almost always has some science that comes along with it. Um, so for me, that's sort of cheating. Uh, when we look in other people's stories, um, usually what we'll do is we, we start by just poking around what science means to them or, or memories they have of science class, scientists they've dated, um, or if they are a scientist of their research. And then you, you're, you're looking for the one that they think, oh yeah, this time something happened to me. And then you can hook a story around that. Um, but as far as specifically which bit of science to explain, um, we try to be very, that's not our goal, so we don't, we don't usually start there. Well, it's, I guess part of what I was sort of wondering is, it, is communicating or, or getting at some kernel of science the point of this personal story, or is in fact the science a kind of MacGuffin that gives you an, a, a, a kind of little bit of a narrative driver that is in fact uh, not important to the story? The second, with, with one caveat. So yes, we, we actually, we think about science as the MacGuffin a lot, right? That's the thing that, that drives the story. We want it to, um, you know, our, our, our goal is to tell good stories and to, to make clear that good stories in the sense of things with large emotional arcs, with characters and character development, those can involve science. And so that's why actually MacGuffin is, is the, very much the right thing to, to hook onto, because that, lets us put science in a story, drive it forward, and not, um, not have to let the emotion turn on it. You let the emotion turn on the things that happen in people's lives. And then the science comes along for the ride. Um, so no, we're not trying to get a specific thing across. What we're trying to get across is the notion that science can be part of these big emotional arcs. And it so, it, it so happens that usually when people tell these stories, you do get to learn some science. Um, but that's sort of a side effect for us the way we usually construct them. Which isn't to say you couldn't flip that, and if you did have a bit of science you wanted to, to, to get across, use this. So, but that's just not how we do it. Yeah. Okay, so uh, if, uh, correct me here. So from your standpoint, for your purposes, yeah. um, uh, a good story for Story Collider mm -hmm. is something moving and personal that happens by coincidence to happen to a scientist? Not quite. It's, it's something moving and personal that involves science in some way. Involve, and the, more, and the okay. more fundamentally science is involved, the better it is for us. Um, that can be a challenge. We don't always hit that as hard as we like. Um, but yes, so, so the idea is that it, it ideally is something that turns on something related to science. So maybe that's because it happens in a lab, and so we have a story of some crazy romantic triangle in a lab. Um, for us, that accomplishes the purpose of making clear that, that science is a human activity and that it isn't done by robots and white lab coats. So that's why we like those stories. Or sometimes it's, it actually really does turn on learning the science. We had a beautiful story once by, um, by a film editor, the uh, name of Aaron Wolf, um, and he was depressed. He was um, wanting to pursue a career as a musician and a writer and failing at it. Um, and he had fallen out of love with science when the Challenger exploded. Right? So he had all, this, all these problems. Mm -hmm. And then he gets a job editing a film, a documentary uh, about the Hubble Space Telescope. Mm -hmm. And when you're an editor, of course, the first thing you do is you go into a room and you do nothing but watch tape for hundreds and hundreds of hours. So he goes into this little editing room, watches hundreds of hours of tape of astronomers and cosmologists and amateur astronomers talking about the universe. And the way he tells it in his story, he reached some moment where he just hit this transcendent state hearing about uh, the particular one was somebody making the point that, you know, all, we are star stuff and so all the, all the laws of physics up there, they're the same as the laws of physics down here, we're all part of the same thing. And just hearing whatever state he was in at that moment, learning that fact, threw him out of it. He went on, yeah. edited the film, and then started submitting his own music and writing, and he's now very successful and has done amazingly well. So that one did hinge on him learning this particular bit of science. So tell us just a little bit about Story Collider itself, and then I, and then I want to back up a bit, but but just tell us about the organization. Oh sure, um, it's very 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 small. Um, it's <laughs> essentially you, <laughs> yeah. and you, a colleague. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, mostly me and a woman named Erin Barker, who comes from the journalism writing world. Mm -hmm. uh, we run it full time. Um, it was founded by me and another physicist, um, who since moved to London and now runs it off in London. Um, 
Um, but mainly, Aaron and I produce the shows, we, do, we run the shows, we are finding the storytellers, we run the website, and then we have um, a number of people who help out in other ways. So Rose, who's sitting in the back here, does a lot of our sound recording and podcast editing. Um, we have a producer in Boston who helps us produce the shows there, um, and we're building out sort of a few other people that way, but mainly it's run by the two of us. Um, started coming up on four years ago, our four year anniversary show is coming up in a month, um, which we're very excited about, month and a half. Um, and yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I lost track of where I was That's going. Right. Um, I, w I would like to understand just a little bit about how this sort of works yeah. uh, as an organization mechanically. If you were putting out a magazine, I'd have a vague idea that there were people in a room typing on a screen and somewhere things got printed and then got distributed. That's right. But so here I'm not so sure. I mean, yep. it's, a, it's a theatrical venture but it's also an online entity, podcasting, mm -hmm. as, you, as you mentioned. So uh, I'm, I'd like to know a little bit about how you produce this. How do you put right. it on? Um, it's similar to a magazine in the sense that we are constantly out there. We, we, we fulfill multiple roles. So one of them is like an editor. We are looking for stories. We are going to find stories from people. A um, big part of my job, honestly, is just going out and watching people talk and so finding people who might be interested. We get submissions, so we read through pitches. So a lot of that is the same. People pitch um, you people pitch. narratives, yeah. they're personal narratives. Yep. Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah. So, yes, yeah, so there's a big process of sorting through those and then soliciting people to tell stories. Um, and then once we have that, again, it's a bit like an editor and also a bit like a theater director in that we will hop on the phone with people talk through their story, um, help them find a structure. Usually the people we have aren't writers, so you're, you're gonna approach it differently than you would if you were an editor. So we're, we spend a lot of time you know, teaching people basics of storytelling that you wouldn't do if you were an editor because you hope you don't work with a writer who needs that. Um, but so, so we'll do that, we'll help them construct their draft, and then um, as the show is coming up, we'll go through it uh, on the phone with them, and then we'll uh, near Right before the show, we get everyone together, do a rehearsal, um, and then the show itself happens. So that's the, how, to, how we produce the live show. Um, and then, yeah, we record it, um, and then those recordings once a week, um, we edit it, but by we, I mean Rose, um, <laughs> uh, and put those out on, you know, we publish to, to SoundCloud and our own site and on iTunes and all this stuff. And so, yeah, so there's a lot of the mechanics there, which is, again, is very similar. I, we have a CMS. We, we get the podcast, we record the intro, splice it all together, send it out, um, mainly to our subscribers. So yeah. now you're working, your storytellers, the people that you're getting pitched by or whatever, are scientists. No. no? Um, some are. Who so are we, they? we strive. Who, we, so who wants to tell a story at Story Collider? Lots of people, which is very nice. Um, mm -hmm. what, what we want is, so our, our goal, the way we say it, is um, we want to break down this idea that there's this wall between science people and mm -hmm. not science people. And, you know, normal people are over here and crazy weird people who are robots in white lab coats over here. Um, and if you're not a science person, then science just isn't anything you have to encounter or deal with and isn't part of your life. Okay, that's the view that we want to break down. So we, we come at that from two ways. We have the scientists tell stories, and the main function there, the way we conceive of it, is to humanize them, is to, to make clear that science is just people doing stuff, a particular stuff, but it's people, and they're doing it. And so a lot of the same stories happen. There's dating stories. There's having issues with your father's stories. There's having issues with your grad advisor stories. Um, you know, and, and you know, again, as always, we're looking for the, all the classic storylines, um, different sorts of relationships and how they change. Maybe it's your relationship with the universe or with yourself. That's, uh, but all, the, all the, those things. And so um, like half of a show, we want to be scientists doing that. The other half, we want to be not scientists. Um, telling stories about how science has been a part of their life to do the other part of that equation and show that this really is something that, that affects everyone and, and that everyone um, is a part of. And so for those, again, it's all classic stories, but we find some place where science fits into their life. Um, a lot of times that's medical. It's a very, very common one. A lot of times it's science class or one of their parent or a sibling or a, um, a lover is a scientist and dealing with that. Um, or it's just like with Aaron's story where he ended up learning about it through some, mm -hmm. some happenstance. Um, there's lots of ways that it shows up. But so the, ideally it's half and half. Um, and the people pitching us at this point are actually about half and half, which is kind of nice. So many of us here are writers. Um, 
we're obsessed with narrative. We're usually um, trying to find a, a personality or a vehicle or a situation, a progression that will carry the freight of mm -hmm. some explanatory um, scientific development or scientific process we want to yep. shed light on, that we want to elucidate. Um, I wonder, are the, are the, from where you sit, are the, are the sort of the narrative tools of like what makes a good oral story um, the same or, or different from what makes a good written narrative? Because they're both narratives. Yep. So yeah, I mean obviously many of them are. Um, I think you know it, you need a you need a strong character arc. You need um, some emotional resonance. You need um, a good beginning. You tell the story until it hits the end, and then you stop. Um, things like that are are universal. Um, one thing that's very different, I would say, about oral storytelling versus written is the amount of exposition you can do. Um, the amount of setup. The amount of setup. The amount of just explaining things. Um, I think you have far less time on the stage where you can get away with that. Um, the story I told here is about as far as I've ever pushed it. And there wasn't much, right? You know, I'd said a little bit about geologic strata, a little bit about the age of various things. Um, but in this kind of story, that's, that's as far as, as we've ever pushed it. And I'm, I'm sort of, I, I told that one because I'm working now on pushing it a, a mm -hmm. farther if I can. But um, you really have very little time. It's, it's much more akin to movies in that sense, where in a, like a feature movie, um, you know, you, the amount of time that you can spend um, in a fiction feature on, on exposition is tiny, absolutely minuscule. Um, and so I, I think those, those are the same, or right. those are you, different. You just way, say it's sure. a dilithium crystal exactly. and move on. Yeah. yeah, exactly. But no, I'm surprised you say that because of course, what separates your effort from say others mm -hmm. um, is that you're specifically concerned with sort of the science aspect mm -hmm. of it. But what I'm hearing from you kind of makes me think like you don't trust it to carry its own weight? Or is there something about no, I don't explaining stuff to people who were looking you in the eye? Well, I don't trust it to carry its own weight on stage. Yeah, that's true, um, okay. because I've seen it go wrong too many times. Um, you, can, you can obviously craft a narrative that is in the context of a lecture where what you're doing is explaining things. You know, and Ted is a great example of that. You know, that's, that's what they do. Is, is, you know, actually speaking of Ed Young, he just had a talk came out um, that has this brilliant structure that's not a personal narrative or anything. No, it's about parasites. It's about yes, parasites. Yeah. Lovely, beautifully done. He gets all kinds of information across. So certainly you can do that. Um, the reason we don't put much in is that we are concerned with this idea that, that science can be connected to these deeply human narratives. Right? And so we're playing by the rules of the, the human narrative. Um, which is why we look more, far more to screenwriting than we do to documentary. Um, and, and you know, one of our goals is to create a kind of place where you can tell stories about science in a way that's appealing to people who are not going to go to a science lecture, who are not going to watch a documentary. Um, so there's, there's a huge audience now for this kind of personal storytelling. Um, and one of our goals is to say, all right, let's do that and show you that science can fit into this. Um, and to do that, you have to, to go away from a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of the, the standard formats of lecture and documentary. Yes, and, and speaking of standard formats of lecture, I want to make, make uh, it clear that uh, all of you are part of this conversation. I encourage you to interrupt and digress. And if you think we're getting away with uh, something, please nail us and uh, 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 bring us to heel. And is there a question here? Yes, this is just, just kind of an mic tangentially to what you were talking about. You said that you've been working on the story and kind of pushing it, the one that you just told us. Uh, how many times do you think you've told that story uh, to various yeah. people and, um, yeah. That one, uh, twice. So this is only the second time I've, I've taken it out. It, and actually it evolved from years ago. One of the first stories I ever told at the Moth was about this visit. It was this story of that visit to Ireland and it had no science in it whatsoever. It was a completely separate story. Um, and I, I sort of realized I could do this, I had never done this part. I didn't do the visit to the island. Um, I had ended it in a different place. Um, realized, oh, this, I, I could make this into a science story and I could really connect this to geology. Um, so I've been, I've been trying that out. Um, but to, to answer sort of the more generic question of how, how many times do we do these stories, um, the one I told, I told one at the Moth recently on the main stage. 
that's at the other extreme, where I think I had, before doing that one on the Moth main stage, uh, I think I had told it at probably 10 different venues, not counting all the rehearsals I did with it, and it went through a lot of, a lot of adjustment in between there. Um, yeah, and, and just workshop to the various people, and yeah, so yeah. many iterations. I wanna follow up on his, yeah. on his very good question. So how do you rehearse one of these things? How mm -hmm. do you edit yourself? I mean, how do you decide? I mean, I'm, I'm actually struck that you, if I understood you correctly, that this story that you nicely shared with us earlier actually started out as just a, a personal story. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with science. You decided to kind of graft that in somewhere. You know, I'm just, tell us about the rehearsal process. How do you, how do you edit this? How do you, how do you grow this? anecdote into a, a performance piece? Different people obviously have, have different ways of doing it. It's a very, I think it even, like writing obviously very idiosyncratic. I think this kind even more so because it is about your life. But, so I can tell you, my, my process is I sit at home, I pace up and down and scare my cat as I sort of like tell myself little stories and they sort of grow. And so I'll, I'll pick a seed. So. Um, the initial seed in this story was sitting on that cliff face. Um, in the first version that I told that you didn't tell you guys it was a scene you didn't even hear where my dad actually got stuck in one of these castles. Um, and I'll sort, of, I'll sort of have that scene in mind and then I'll flesh it out. I'm like, okay, what do I need to explain to get here? What do I need to do to, to make this resonate? What, can, what connects to this that's interesting to talk about? And it's sort of, I start from one place I'm very interested in. It isn't always the end, but in this case it was. Um, and grow out where, where the story needs to go. So usually they start as me doing things that are like 10, 30 seconds, and then grow out into these 10 minute stories. Ben, ben how important is it Thank to you, you that, uh, that the story be true? Uh, uh, I mean, it seems to me that, you know, those of us who, who do text, it's sort of baked into the idea that, you know, depending on the context in which people see the text, you know, it should be a given that, that this is true. This is our, this is our best attempt at, at describing reality. But with oral storytelling is a different tradition mm -hmm. uh, and not necess doesn't necessarily carry the same assumptions. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? We have a very complicated relationship to that because exactly because of that and, and on top of that, um, so, yes, to, to, to everything you said, and then added to that for us, of course, is the fact that we're coming at this from a science angle, where you also want to make sure the science is correct. And that's a part you very much don't want to make up. Um, and we have an additional complication on that end, which is, okay, we're interested in people's experience of science. For scientists, fine, they're gonna get the science right. For the non-scientists, a lot of times they have this deep experience with science, and the science that they're experiencing is wrong in some sense. And then you, you get into a really tricky question of, okay, you know, the, the truth of the story needs to carry with it some false science. Um, fortunately, this doesn't come up very often, and usually it's stuff that we can tweak and, and get across that, that fact. And so that hasn't been a, a huge problem, but it's something I worry about a lot. Um, you know, we, we err, and, and the moth as well, tend much more towards the truth side of this. Certainly, the, the long tradition of oral storytelling, you, you almost don't care. Um, and then it, it got connected to the theater where the notion of what, what even a true play is gets, gets mushed up because of the constraints of the forum and, and, and also just the history. Um, so for us, the, our, our line is pretty hard as to what we'll, what we'll accept in terms of fabrication. We will, usually it's something in service of the story that would just make it boring otherwise, where you know, we'll, we'll have people do things where something happened, um, like, okay, in this story, um, I, said, I said that we, we flew into Shannon, took the bus to Glasgow, or uh, Galway, and then, uh, that would have been a trip, um, took the bus to Galway and then rode down to Spittle. I'm pretty sure that's not true. Um, I don't strictly remember the, where we went straight from Galway, and I'm not 100% sure that was the first place we went to, to be honest. Part of that's because um, I was 11 and I wasn't taking mm -hmm. notes. Um, and this comes up a lot. Just like, I, I was 11 years old, I don't remember. Um, so, so the thing to do then is just do something that's plausible that doesn't change the meaning of the story if you're, if you're doing it. And then um, I think we actually stopped at a couple <coughs> towns before we got to Spittle overnight. And I left that out just because, all right, this isn't, 
really advancing the story to say that. That's actually about the line where we draw it. We're like, things like that, that condense time, that, that make the story move along, but don't actually change any way you look at a character or the meaning of people's actions. That to us is fine. Um, anything more than that, we really start getting, getting upset. How do you know? We don't, and that's, um, we have no way of, of fact checking most of these. Um, and so, so yes, we are at a certain level taking our storyteller, at a very large level, taking our storytellers on faith on that. Um, and that is a big caveat to all of us. So what does that, yeah, you got, you got uh, what does that say then, Ben? I mean, that's sort of sacrilege to, you know, traditional journalists. What? You can't, you can't make anything up. You, you can't take a tank of thing. Uh, you know, this is a slippery slope, and, and you know, we're, we're hardliners on this. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that valid? Or really, it is, is, you know, why is, it a, why, why is, why is some falsity okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other not. I mean, to be clear, I'm not advocating doing this in journalism. Um, hmm. And uh, part of it is, part of it is, is this notion, um, and I'm gonna repeat a phrase that has resonance for many of you. Um, we don't bill ourselves as journalism. Um, we're not claiming to be reporters. We are claiming to be a place where people tell their story. Um, I do think that actually is one key difference here. We are not, I am never telling someone else's story when I do this, I'm telling my own. So if I'm, I, I would have a much harder time, and I wouldn't do it, changing things about someone else's story, because I don't know what's important about that, I don't know you know, what, what I could elide, or I, if I should. Um, when I'm telling my own story, uh, what I wanna say is I'm the only one who gets hurt if it, if it gets screwed up. Of course, I'm the only one who gets aggrandized, too. Uh, <laughs> so there, there is that. Um, but, again, the, the point is that the format is, this is the stories that we tell. The, the promise is not, this is the truth that we tell, but this is, this is an, a, an artistic form that grew up with the notion of these are the stories that you tell your friends over drinks. These are the stories that you, that you tell about how your life works. And what we're doing is we're presenting those stories on stage. And the, the art then is, it's not a window into what happened in the world. It's a window into the way we understand what happens to us in the world. So, for me, the truth is, is this a story that you would tell your friends at the bar? That's not necessarily the same as saying, is this a true story about something that happened in the world? Because what we're after is, who are we hmm. as human beings and the way we relate to other people? Um, and what we're after in particular is showing that when science is involved, you relate to human beings in exactly the same way that you do um, with other things. And you know, honestly, when we tell stories on the bar, it's subject to all kinds of distortions. And when you try to remember things, it's, you know, we know from, from science that these things get massively distorted by repeat memory of the things. And so, again, I think, I think the key question for us in this form is, is this the right story that you would be telling to someone at a bar? And that's, that's what we're interested in, and that's what we're interested in exploring. Do, do you think that journalists should be thinking more about that instead of this uh, slavish, uh Devotion to the truth? No, I don't. I, you you um, don't think we're losing any power uh, from that? I, oh, I, you I might think, be. I think yeah. we might be. Oh, yeah. You probably are. Um, certainly, you can, you can easily make stories more powerful by leaving out inconvenient details. Um, <laughs> but I don't think that's a reason to do it. Um, no, I, I, I think these are very different things, right? If you, if you are doing journalism, that's your promise to the reader is that, that you're being truthful. Um, our promise to the listener is that we're exploring who we are as humans, which is, which is just a different question to me. Um, that but the said, issue of authenticity, yeah. 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 let's yeah. change the word and not call it right. accuracy, because perhaps that's misplaced. But we share a thirst for authenticity. Mm -hmm. And a classic journalist, is, is, uh, as Dan is, is positing, would, would buttress and make a case for the authenticity of their material mm -hmm. by attributing it to a lot of people and then interviewing people and quoting them and said, yeah, 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 what he or she said is 
probably pretty close to what happened and you know and, and of course that slows stories down and things mm -hmm. and with your medium um, the 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 character the physical presence of the storyteller the participant in the story is like a down payment on authenticity it is and so what I wonder and one of the reasons I'm very curious about this what you do is as we are as journalists spreading ourselves around different platforms and different technologies and actually reaching out to different ways of storytelling we're adopting a lot of the things that you mm -hmm. do I mean there's not so much difference between your story and a journalist channeling something on a, uh, a WSJ live video I mean mm -hmm. that you are trafficking in presence. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering uh, whether that then changes the requirements, if I can put it that way. That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I can think of two, th th there's sort of two questions here. One is, okay, so, so the question, but I, I like the, the word authenticity. And you know, one way of, of getting it in answer to Dan's question is, is what we're after is recreating a correct feeling of the emotion that the, the person feels about this story in their life. And a lot of times getting that emotional impact correct means you have to, to skip time and you have to do these things. Um, the other thing that, that comes up is just, it's, it's the question of trade-offs between time and accuracy. And so, so you're right that a lot of what happens when you're doing a live video is that it's about presence and who you are, but also a lot of it is just the, the incredibly short word count you have. Um, when, hmm. you're, when you're talking, you, you get far fewer words than when you're writing, and that sounds like comparing apples and oranges, but um, you know, when, when we do a story, we give people 10 minutes, which is really 15, and to, to do the story, they have about 1,500 words. Hmm. which is not a lot, as you know. And if you're trying to do weave a complex story, you, you just don't get a lot of words. Um, the longest TED Talks I've ever seen is sort of maybe three and a half thousand, um, which is enough to yeah, do a lot, yeah, but it's yeah. not a, an enormous number. No, that would be 18 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so, you know, if you're doing some live interview, um, yes, you, you, you're getting a lot across with presence, but you're also just having to make a trade-off of you, you only have 30 seconds to make whatever point you're making. Sir, do you have a, a oh, yeah. oh no, I beg your pardon, who's got the mic? Whoever has the mic rules. The mic is the wand, the talking stick. Yes, you. Uh, I, I, was, <laughs> I was just struck by, well, you, you, you're saying there's this shared concern with authenticity, but I, I, I guess it, it seems to me that there's a very important difference in that the, the, the underlying motive for for sort of taking the stage in a lot of journalism about science is to talk about the science. I mean, it's just like mm -hmm. th th this happened this week, or this is a new turn, and so on. And that seems to me to be so unnarrative sometimes, you know. Uh, um, and and I think that's why some of the narrative in journalism is somehow sometimes so hokey and disappointing, is because it's sort of tacked on to this other goal, which is about you know, just telling you what happened this week. And, and so um, there's such a fundamental difference between wanting to represent a person and wanting to represent the ideas um, that uh, are different from last week's ideas. And I'm just interested in your thoughts about how, you know, how what you do might sort of inform that, what we're doing on the other side of that gap. Um, I, I don't have any good answers because I, I think there aren't any. And, and my first thought is that yes, that's just genuinely a hard problem. And maybe a lot of times the right answer if, is to, to maybe just skip the notion of story entirely. I mean, if, if it's gonna feel grafted on, maybe the right way to do it is just as a straight explainer. Um, and and I, I do think that uh, that this notion can be overused if you're, if you're trying too hard to, to force something into something it doesn't want to be. And, th and the thing about new science discoveries is that A, a lot of times they don't have this kind of emotionally resonant story attached to them. Like they're interesting discoveries, but okay, so they're an interesting discovery. Um, and a lot of times we don't know the story yet, right? You know, when, when something comes out, it can take, in, in science, it can take a long time to figure out what's actually going on and, and what's there. Um, and so that's, that's what you're running up against. And the short answer to your question is that there's no easy solution. 
Um, yeah, I, I, I think I, as much as I, I hate to say it, I, I do think the right answer a lot of times is to say, you know, if the story isn't resonating, drop it. There's got to be something else or, or, or look for another way. Like I don't, I, I do hear a lot of people, um, especially in the, the so-called science communication world, running around saying things like every story is a, every paper is a story, every scientific research project is a story. And in, for some definition of story, that's correct. Um, but for the kind that we're talking about here, that's the kind of emotionally resonant story that works, that gets people engaged, that's just not always true. I think that's a really important point, and that is that not everything lends itself to narrative, no. and it's really important for storytellers to keep that in mind, that sometimes just the facts is fine, yeah. you know? And, and uh, there's nothing worse than a forced narrative. It's embarrassing and awkward and just, ugh, you know? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, the sort of spurious uh, touches of, of, uh, of character. But I think it's also true that there's, there's conventions in our field that for, I mean, I, I'm personal, I don't want to sound like a crank, but I, mean, I have occasionally found a good narrative and found that it just didn't fit the format that I was being asked to write for. And so perhaps the answer is, with all this plethora of new media, is to sort of sort things out. Say, okay, here's, my, here's what I do for this format, but I had this wonderful story and I'll go tell it at and, and the, the exciting thing is now in the, in the written world, there's a lot of great platforms for, for good narratives now, which is exciting. I haven't seen the same in the TV video world as much, and I would love to see that. And I don't know if anyone's thinking through that, but that would be lovely. Yeah, yeah no, I think it's important to, to, to frame this conversation with the idea that, you know, we don't, we don't live in a world where there's text over here and, and there are good visuals here and... Uh, and these pictures are still and those pictures move. I mean, no. And it, it behooves us, I've been looking all day for a chance to use that word. It <laughs> behooves us to really embrace all of these storytelling techniques. And it is cur a curious thing, a curious thing of timing that in the past decade or so, there has been a real revival of, I don't know if it comes from practitioners, and I'd like to know your opinion, and then we'll get to that question there. Mm -hmm. or whether it's a thirst from an audience for a, uh, a reintroduction of a live conversation about a topic. Um, and sometimes, you know, when we hear a scientist actually talk about her or his work, you know, we're so enlivened by it because we've been taught to kill it when we put it on a page. But also there's something visceral and chemical going on. I mean, why, why do you think that we're more interested in this stuff now? Why is there now TED? Why is there TEDx? I mm -hmm. mean, TED I could explain, but the TEDx phenomenon is, is, is pretty wild. Why yeah. the moth? Uh, why Story Collider? Uh, I think it is, so, so the question is, is that now, it should just I mean, happen, yeah. or are there reasons? And I think it's both, and I think, um, so th there is a sense in which you, you can look at, um, you know, you, you have really amazing technical spectacles. You've got Avatar, you've got all these wonderful effects-filled movies and, and technological phenomena that, that inform our entertainment. And from that, you can easily construct a narrative that, that there's a, not a backlash, but a wanting to, to also do the other thing, where all of that is stripped away and you're really getting back to just this sort of pure interaction and storytelling. So you can, you, you can tell that story. Um, but the other thing that happened that's really interesting is that these things came about um, not just, uh, you know, there's, there's been special effects movies and things like that for a while, um, but these things all sort of started around the same time. Like The Moth and Ted, they all sort of started taking off around the same time. And it was when this sort of notion of, uh, or the ability to do these little transmissions over a wide scale happened. So podcasting, digital video, and these things. So if you look at a phenomenon like the moth, right, it's, it's a bunch of people in a room telling stories in the old campfire way. That's sort of the story about what it is. And Ted is a slightly different one, but again, it's people in a room having this lecture. It's an expensive campfire. Yes, yeah. yes. <laughs> um, but what's really driven both of them, um, in the case of the moth, is podcasting, and their podcast took off. 
And so this, this little intimate format between a bunch of people is actually able to reach lots and lots of people. And the same thing with TED, like the, the conference was going along, et cetera, and then uh, small scale video happened, and all of a sudden these videos could reach massive numbers of people. And this is where the TEDx phenomenon comes from. Um, and and you, you, can, you can sort of share this infinite experience with millions of people. And I think it's the combination of those two things, of yes, wanting some stepping back from technology and seeing things in a more intimate environment, but also having the technical ability to do that on a larger scale. Um, is very interesting. And then once people know about it, that creates an ecosystem where more things can happen. So, you know, our, our show honestly benefited tremendously from that. If people didn't generally know about the Moth and about TED and things like that, I don't think our thing would have happened. It would have been much harder to get off the ground. But the fact that it's known as a thing that people do, now there's a whole ecosystem. So now there's us, there's Nerd Night, there's the Secret Science Club. I can rattle these off. There are tons of different live science events that people love going to and, and connecting to. Um, and so, which gives the final part of, of the answer to your question is, yeah, maybe it is just a little bit of happenstance that now is just when, you know, something sparked in the zeitgeist and, okay, here we are doing a bunch of this stuff and it'll be something else in the next decade. In the back of your question. Uh, yeah. Thank so you for your patience. Sure. No um, ben, you hear a lot of stories, both good and bad, and mm -hmm. so I'm wondering if you have a sort of one thing or two things that ruin a story or make for mm. the worst story yep. that we should all avoid whenever yep. possible. Yep. Um, we, we started a series on this actually that I started publishing on my blog. Um, our number one piece of advice, um, which is the single most common note that we get, is end when the story is over. Do not keep going once, once the action has stopped. Um, and it, what's really interesting about a live show, and this is where it can be instructive going to them, and, and you can learn a lot, is okay, you sort of know that generically in print. But if you do that at a live show, you get feedback. Because as soon as the, you can see this happen, the storyteller's going, their narrative ends, everyone is paying attention, and then they start to explain what it all means. And you can just see people lean back, you can see them get up and go to the bar, like it's visceral, immediate feedback that, oh, that should have ended a while ago. Um, that's our number one. The second one is related, start in the middle of the action, don't spend a lot of time setting it up. Um, and then the other thing that ruins stories is not going to come as a surprise to any science writer, uh, too much technical explanation. And that will tank any story very, very quickly. We have a few more questions. Yeah. Hi. Um, I have a question about, uh, a little bit about what you just touched on and sort of what you were talking about one question before. And that is that sometimes stories do really, really well in the room and terribly on the podcast. Yeah. So like you listen to it and a story that like, made you totally wrapped in the room just falls really flat when you just hear it. Um, and, so, uh, and the converse will happen. If someone doesn't end at the end, I can just like cut it off yeah. and then all of a sudden you've got like a really awesome podcast. Yep. Um, and so I'm wondering two things. One, um, which is more important to you, the people mm. in the room or the people that are your podcast audience? And then secondly, um, if you feel like those two audiences need the same things or, or are the same people even? I wish I knew the answer to the last question. We know a bit about our podcast audience because we can survey them. Weirdly, we know less about our live audience because it's harder to survey them. It's more invasive somehow. Um, why it happens? Was that part of the question? Because I'm not sure. sure. Um, I mean, I have some yeah. theories about yeah. why it happens. <laughs> you do. So I mean, I, I well, mean, the, 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 the given is that people react differently to the story live than they do on podcast. Yeah which I find interesting anyway, yeah. is that really true? It is, it is, and in fact, in, you know, the reason Rose knows this so well is we've, it, it started happening that we would, we would have a story and Aaron and I were just like, this is great, and we give it to Rose, and she writes us, she's like, really guys? Um, and uh, so what we've actually started doing is we have a policy, um, which I'm not 100% great at implementing recently, but um, we have a policy that, that no story goes out on the podcast unless it's been listened to by somebody who wasn't in the room um, as hmm. a check, and it's, Sometimes it's something really uh, easy to spot, like occasionally somebody will say something that is slightly offensive. And what happens when you do that with a bunch of people at a table, like if a bunch of your friends are sitting around a table and somebody says something slightly offensive, usually your reaction is to, especially if it's a friend, 
let it slide or not even notice it sometimes or you know, move, or move around it. And because this style of storytelling, that's what you're trying to recreate. You're recreating the idea that you're telling a story to your friends at the bar. And sometimes you succeed very well at that. And what that means is somebody can actually slip something like that in and the, the live audience doesn't notice it or doesn't react to it and keeps going with the story. When something like that goes out on the podcast, it, it stops you and you're like, what, what just happened? Um, so that's the easy one, but those are actually pretty rare. Um, I can only think of one example that that's happened to us. Um, I, more often, I think that it's, it is this presence thing. So because we are um, audio, um, you, you don't get the, the, the physical presence. And that can, for some people, it doesn't matter much. I think for some people that does a tremendous amount to informing the story, and I think those are the ones where there's a real mismatch, where for whatever reason it's their physical presence. Like maybe they're telling a really hard story, but they're smiling while they're doing it. Um, you know, things like that can happen that really change your reading of what they're saying. Um, whereas, in, and if you know, if you can't see that smile, you lose it, and all of a sudden it reads totally differently. Um, but to be honest, I don't have great answers um, to why. That's something we. And I don't think the moth does either. I've talked to them about this. They don't really know. Um, as to which is more important, uh, the live experience, uh, for the very simple reason that if, uh, if a story dies in the room, it can affect the stories that come after. So it's a very selfish mm. reason. It's just like mm. if that happens, then you're sort of sacrificing the rest of the show. So you make sure the show goes well, and then the podcast usually takes care of itself. Just to, to sort of uh, merge your last two answers. In, in my experience, and I've, I've totally learned this the hard way, it's getting outside the story at the end that really, <laughs> the other day I was, I was upstate giving a talk and the audience was totally into everything that I was saying. They were my people. They, they, I was talking very specifically about the very dramatic things that happened in this place that I, I wrote my book about. And and they were eating it up. And then, for reasons that I cannot explain, I felt the need, maybe it was the professor in me or whatever, I felt the need to go outside the story at the end and start telling them, and here's what you should believe as, as the result of this. Hmm. And I looked over at my wife, who happened to be in the audience on a rare occasion, and she was actually going like this <laughs> very aggressively, very yeah. aggressively, <laughs> because it was clear you could feel the air leaving the room, you know, basically, uh, and, and it's from going outside of the story. Well, I, connecting I that to, to Lena's question, one yeah. of the other most common notes we give is people will sometimes say something to the effect of, you know, and I'm here telling you this story, or some, some phrase that reminds you that you're listening to a story. And we always make them cut that because of exactly this. If you're there, you're locked into the story, you're in the world, and somebody reminds you that you're listening to a story, you pop out and you're like, oh, I, what am I doing? Wait, where am I? Um, and that ruins huh. it. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. You, you talked a little bit about the different types of stories that you see, mm -hmm. you know, the conflict with your father, the conflict with your advisor. Do you worry about these stories becoming formulaic? And if you do, what do you, what do, you do to avoid that? We're not old enough that I'm worried about that yet, to be, to be honest. Um, we <laughs> the, the one story I currently have a ban on, um, I'm so sorry for telling this to this audience, uh, the one story I currently ban is how I became a science writer. <laughs> 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 uh, just because we've had too many of them recently. Um, but that's it, mostly an accident of, of history. Um, no, we don't, and, and mainly because uh, mainly because we're too young, and I'm sure that'll become a problem later. But you know, um, the thing about getting stories from people's lives as opposed to writing them is that people's lives aren't formulaic. And so you're, you're always going to be running into people who tell you a story, and you're like, wait, seriously, what? Dude, come tell that story. And you know, that there's, there's no end to creative, strange things that have actually happened to people. There is an end to creative, strange things that, that a small group of people can dream up. And that's where I think a lot of the formulaic problem comes from. Um, I, I probably do worry that you know, we, we've been sending out the same examples for the last couple years to prospective storytellers. I should probably mix that up because that's probably leading us to hmm. lock in on, on certain things. Um, this happened at TED for a while. Um, they had a couple talks that were super successful and so people tried to sound like those for a while and that didn't work out so well for a lot of them. Um, they've been trying to mix that up. 
So yes and no, but mostly no, I guess. So I'm curious now. We're journalists. You're a physicist turned stand-up guy. Mm -hmm. I stand very straight. We all traffic in story. Yeah. I wonder what you see in what we do mm -hmm. with story that makes you crazy. Oh. That makes you reach out and say, oh, no, please, please, no. No, <laughs> stop that. That makes you want to reach for whatever the stand-up improv guy's equivalent of a red crayon markup pencil is. What are our bad habits when we come to storytelling? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, I don't have a great answer because the things that annoy me the most are the things that I'm closest to. So if you ask me what annoys me about moth stories and moth style stories, I could rattle off a whole list. Um, I don't spend as much time worrying about journalist stories because that's not, that's your problem, not mine. But, um, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so I haven't thought it through and haven't, haven't managed to get myself bothered yet. So, so the short answer to your question yet is, is I don't, I don't think there's a whole lot to worry about. Um, I think, you know, the thing that actually does annoy me the most is, uh, is getting back to this notion of too much exposition and too much um, technical stuff. Um, and I think, I'm gonna say something really weird that's gonna sound, well, I don't, I don't know. Um, when you're looking at science pieces that are narratives, um, this is not talking about news pieces or hmm, explainers, no but about the, the narratives, I think there is a real tendency in the science journalism world to be overly concerned, not just with accuracy, which is fine, but with a, a very precise version of accuracy that will make the scientists in the story happy. And, and I see a lot of times a lot of detail that honestly I don't think needs to be there. Well, so like it, what do you mean? Um, and you can make something up. Yeah, you a great example, um, the best example comes from a guy, um, this wasn't actually journalism, this was an education piece, but, but a similar point. Um, there was a, a guy named Tyler DeWitt at MIT um, did a talk where he was talking about this, um, this one was for kids, but, but, but the point is here that they were talking about what is a virus. And they had some, some textbook and it was explaining that, well, a virus is um, a bit of DNA that inserts itself into a cell and makes it explode. And that's a nice little, it's a story lit and it's great. Um, the problem was that uh, some fraction of viruses are actually made of RNA. And so they made him change it to uh, a virus is a piece of nucleic acid, which is a disaster in terms of getting things across. And it's, it's that level, it's that, that distinction of precision where every once in a while you'll just get language that clearly is there because yes, there's some 7% that you're ignoring, but sometimes you need to make that trade off to make it understandable. Um, another fun one, this is my, my recent favorite, um, uh, the phrase we're all stardust is false. Um, it's false by about 12%. <laughs> Do I care? I'm not sure. Um, but so this idea that we all come from stuff that was forged in an exploding yeah. star, that's mostly true, but about 12% of it is actually primordial, hydro primordial hydrogen from the Big Bang. Um, I knew it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that one is a fascinating case because on the one hand, I, I don't care. The, the, the intent of the, the point is clear without the clarification. On the other hand, in that case, the clarification itself is actually pretty cool. Um, but, but yeah, so that, that's my number one is, is again, letting the, the narrative get too bogged down in making the details so precise that they can't be argued with. Um. So here, right here. This is such a wonderful conversation that I kind of hesitate to bring it down to really um, dollars and cents. But the podcast is available for free. The wonderful Story Collider events are not very expensive and you must have to rent the bars. Um, how do you make money? Thank you, Robin. We make money from individual donations. If you would all like to contribute, we would very much appreciate that. You're welcome, that. Ben. <laughs> um, I don't think she even knew to set that. Um, yeah, so the answer, the short answer is most of our income is, is from individual donations. Um, we've gotten some small grants and, and we pursue those. Um, we also, the nice thing about, what the, the vibe we go for is this very downtown theater thing 
And so we, in fact, do not have to rent our space. Um, and the spaces we, we go into are all based on, um, basically, they're all insanely cheap to rent. Um, so there, that's, that bit is very nice. But yeah, the answer is ticket sales, um, individual donations, and grants. And you'd cobble it together the way any, um, any theater nonprofit does. Yeah, what kind of grants? What kind of grants? Um, let's see. Uh, so I mean, so the Sloan Foundation. Yeah, the Sloan um, Foundation. They're the the uh, it's the uh, that's the Did answer you? that comes up all the time. Yeah. Um, we actually technically got a grant from from you at NESW, although that went to Fun Science Studio, which is there was a bunch of legal stuff that that made that technically a story collider project. Um, hi Rose. Um, I we've also looked uh, and and had success and failure at um, the NEA, of course, because we're an arts organization. Um, there's some local arts councils that are very excited about this kind of stuff. Um, and then the, the ones that we've not slotted into the cycle quite yet, but are trying for is, is the NSF and the NIH, um, which in recent years haven't been supporting this stuff as much as they used to, but they, they have historically uh, done a lot. Uh, is it important to you, Ben, in the long run that this have some kind of a revenue stream, or do you consider that irrelevant? Um, yes, from the point of view of I would like it to keep going, and if it doesn't have enough revenue stream, then it stops. Um, no, in the sense that this is a, we're, we're registered as a nonprofit corporation, we're a 501c3, so we don't, we, the founders, don't get any profit out of this. Anything we make gets recycled in. Um, so yeah, I'd like to keep doing it, is the answer. Can I ask you a question about, about uh, motivation? Um, so this is a cool thing to do. It's fun. It's entertaining. People learn, although I, what, what I'm unsure about is whether the learning is, is a, an explicit goal here or just sort of an ancillary bonus when, when it happens. And if the goal is just, just to entertain, not that there's a, entertaining is a, is a wonderful goal, actually. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there will be journalists in the room who will say, well, that's not enough. You right. know. Uh, is it important to you somehow that this be more than just something that people think is fun, and does that matter to you? Yes and no. Um, I, I, I'm going to argue predictably with the word just. Um, okay. So, Yes, the education is an ancillary part, and in fact, at the beginning of every show, we, we make a point of saying that you're not supposed to learn stuff, and if you do find yourself learning stuff, there's a handy bar. Um, you know, that's partially naive, because of course we know that people are going to learn things from this, and, and you know, it's partially to set the mood. The bigger thing that, that we do is, is, yes, it is an entertainment organization, and we, we think of it as a cultural enterprise and not an educational one or an informative one. Um, the reason I argue with the word just is that I think that that is, in fact, one of the more important things we can be doing. Um, so one way I say this is that, and I don't have data for this, so um, with this caveat, if you ask me, if you ask someone, what is the single greatest predictor of whether somebody is going to learn a bit of science that you're trying to teach them? I would argue that, that almost certainly the single greatest predictor of that has nothing to do with the presentation, has nothing to do with the way you frame the content. Uh, the best predictor is whether or not they think science is something they should care about in the first place. And so the point of doing these kinds of cultural enterprises is to, to really get across the idea that, that science is a part of our culture, to build the notion that it's a thing people should care about, um, and to, to grow the sense that it's something they can have a personal attachment to and that will therefore go on to learn from all the, the wonderful education and informative um, stuff that's being done. So I actually think of it as a very ground, bedrock level enterprise. What we're doing is we're building the bedrock that other things can then build on. Right, I, I think that's totally right. And, and uh, you know, I said that, I said just to be provocative, <laughs> but I actually think that's incredibly important is the first step is to make people f feel that reality and the process of determining what reality is can actually be really effing interesting. You know, it really can be. Uh, and that is counterintuitive for a lot of people. And, and if, you can, if you can bridge that, 
then lots of other things can later be layered on that. Uh, so I, I think that's really important. Uh, here's quick, a question. Quick So earlier you mentioned um, fact checking and that it's really hard to, or you have to kind of take people at their word when they're telling you a story. Do you do any kind of um, vetting to make sure that what they're telling you or what they're telling the audience is truthful? Generally speaking, no. Um, for the, most of the time, that would be a nearly impossible task um, because you know they're telling us some story about their mother. I suppose I could call their mom up. Um, most of the time it doesn't matter. The, only, the, the times I would worry about that are, I would worry about that if they were telling a story where they presented another person in a very bad light, but that doesn't come up because we're generally not interested in those stories in the first place, and I generally don't bother putting them on stage. I'm not, I'm not interested in your story about how you hate this person. I'm interested in your story about how you made a mistake. Um, so those don't come up. Um, we do some minimal fact checking on the science itself. Uh, you know, I have a science background, and so I can do some sanity checks and, and do a few checks. And again, if it's if it's easy to, if it makes sense, we'll we'll find a way to slot into the narrative. To you know, if they had some misunderstanding of science and that's what drove the story, we'll make sure that that gets mentioned. Um, so we do do some of that. Um, but for the rest of it, no, because again, the, the goal is that this is, this is more art than, than journalism, and what we're concerned with is presenting people a true picture of how the person telling the story views their own life. So if I come to you and I say, Ben, mm -hmm. we haven't met. Right. My name's Lee. When I was much younger, I lived in Princeton, New Jersey, and you know what? For a while, for a summer, when I was 11, I used to babysit for Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. And I had this incredible experience where he told me all about gravity waves. And I spin this thing out, it's total, total fabrication, mm -hmm. total fabulous. Um, just the sort of thing a, a theater person might do, because it's fun. <laughs> How do you protect yourself? I mean, this isn't an accuracy thing, this is just simply self-protection. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. Uh, you know, that, again, that sort of scenario hasn't really come up. We don't. We don't. I was Freeman yeah. Dyson's hairdresser. I mean, you know, I mean, I could <laughs> pick one. You yeah. Know, but I'm just. Um, no, to be honest, things like that haven't come up where people mm -hmm. have have told. The only people who've told stories about famous scientists are have so far been other scientists, where mm -hmm. I basically mm -hmm. just believe basically believe them. They might mm -hmm. be wrong. Um, so we had a Feynman story from someone who was a student at Caltech with Feynman, mm -hmm. and that's all. Wikipedia, to be honest. Um, not that mm -hmm. that's why I fact check, but like <laughs> this guy, it was Al, it was Alan Lightman, so I do know oh, that he well, was. Alan, yeah, yeah, he's, that's the point. That's um, his pesky regard for facts. I know I it's know. terrible. Um, if a stranger came up to me and said they have a Einstein story, I probably would would wonder about it. Um, but honestly, that just hasn't happened. Yeah, no, it's an interesting question. So I asked you what we did that we're doing that makes you crazy that mm -hmm. we do wrong. I, I wonder what we're doing that you think we're doing right. Um, I think I must be a generally positive person because I, I have a lot more thoughts about that. Um, it, just in general, like right now, I feel like any day of the week I can go and spend the entire day reading excellent narratives about science. Like I feel like right now there's some, something great happening where all these good things are happening. Um, I, th I think the, the flip side, the first thing that comes to mind is the flip side uh, for what you get right is, is the opposite of what you get wrong, which is that most of the time the science and the facts are right. Um, and I, I feel like that's very good. And obviously I know this is a shocking thing to say um, because we hear all these horror stories of badly reported medical stuff and those happen and, and blah, blah, blah. But if you, if you go to, to the really good narrative sites, if you go to Eon or Nautilus or mm -hmm. you know, any of these sites that are publishing this, this long narrative science journalism, it's, the, the science is, is quite amazing. It seems very well vetted and, and accurate. Um, And, and I think the, the narratives are, are very compelling. I think this notion that you need a compelling narrative to, to explain science has rooted itself well enough in this community, not so much in the science community, which is a different problem, mm -hmm. um, that those are being, being produced. Um, and so I'm seeing 
lots of wonderful stories um, with characters. I'm seeing lots of wonderful stories without them. I'll go back to Ed Young's work. You know, he's sort of, he and I discovered recently we're sort of the antithesis. He almost doesn't care about story um, and yet still produces these, these pieces that can drive you along just through the sheer interestingness of the stuff he comes across. Um, so I think, I, I think I'm seeing a lot of really good stuff with fun emotional hooks, with moving emotional um, hooks and, and things like this that, are, that really are grabbing people in a way that's, that's stronger than, than the straight news journalism. Um, so that's, that's what's making me happy. A question in the back? Um, you, sir. To backtrack a few minutes, a few minutes ago, um, what I gathered was that you were saying that a lot of people, well, I guess you view that the way that you present a story is not as important as the intrinsic value that people have in science. And as a public school teacher, I kind of view the opposite in that the way that you present a topic often creates that intrinsic value that people have in it. So hmm. could you please further explain? Hmm. I, I think maybe I didn't track what you said at the top. Uh, um, essentially, what is, the, what is the difference between presenting a story and the way that people already have a viewpoint before hearing your story on the importance of science? I mean, I, th I think what he's saying is, how important is it? Does it make a difference? Does the presentation, do you present the story in a different way, depending on whether the audience is already with you in a sense and grasping the importance of science, or versus somehow sort of selling, that you feel you need to sell the idea mm -hmm. that science is actually important? Yeah, oh, that I absolutely agree with. Um, and I think, I, th I think maybe, maybe I misspoke earlier, because I definitely don't think that, um, that, that science, and I gotta be careful saying this. I do think science is interesting, but I don't think it's obviously interesting to, to people, and I think you do have to motivate it. Um, and I think that is a lot of a, a problem, in, in particular because you know we're all people who love science. And of course, how do you be a good writer is you write about things that interest you in the way they interest you. And so if you really love science and you're going to write about things in a way that interests you, you're gonna write about it from the perspective of someone who's already interested in science. And now you've got yourself into a problem because the people you want to reach are the people who are not already interested in science, and you do need to, to create that. And of course, that's the hard work of doing all of this stuff. So I think absolutely, you know, you, you definitely, you know, this is why we do what we do um, as opposed to, to doing lectures, which is another thing to do and is awesome, but we're trying to, to get at this from a way where we can hook people in who don't think that science is particularly interesting. And one of the great things that happens and that I love is we, we have audience members who come up to us in particular people that I know um, through the storytelling world who will come up to me after shows and say, you know, I thought science was gonna be boring and terrible and yay, the show is amazing and I love it. So I'm happy about how that, that goes. In the back there. Hi, yeah, I'm curious, have you always been a passionate storyteller? Have you always been excited about telling stories? Was it a decision to become a storyteller? Uh, both. So um, the, my trajectory was that I, uh, I actually started my life as a theater major um, and through various things including the fact that uh, the theater department where I went was terrible um, became a, a physicist and that wasn't out of the blue either I had been interested in physics um, but you know throughout high school I was known as the English guy um, I was clearly gonna be a writer um, and then stumbled into a career as a physicist um, and then sort of midway through my postdoc realized that was a mistake, the first thing was right. Um, and, and then at one point literally just quit and said, all right, I'm done, I'm gonna go try to do something else. And at the time I didn't know what it was. Um, moved to New York, went to the Upright Citizens Brigade, started training in improv comedy and through them learned about the moth and then realized, oh, this is it. But even b but before, the reason the moth was, was a good find for me is I knew that what I wanted to do was some kind of science and humanity, science and human lives. I, I wanted to blend those somehow, which is what I had been trying to do with my very badly written plays back in college. Um, you know, so that had always been there, but there was this huge digression trying to be a physicist for a while. Yeah, please. Hi, um, I was wondering, based off of um, your question, does timeliness of the science within the story end up mattering because whether someone comes in at, in your audience with an interest in science already or they end up w being won over, does the timeliness of the issue matter? 
Mm -hmm. You mean the news value? The news value. Yeah. yeah, I mean, yes. so okay. if it's a, like a medical issue or an mm -hmm. ethical issue, it's something that's prevalent and as opposed to, um, let's say with your story, it's right. generally historical science, right. things mm -hmm. we've known. And that's a really good question because mm -hmm. journalism, we're obsessed with the idea of timeliness in, in, in a way that regularly annoys my students, uh, you know, year, year after year, and, yeah. and I'm fighting with them, sort of saying, but you don't understand, this is a huge asset, this idea of timeliness, and I'm not even sure that I'm right about that all, <laughs> all, 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 all the time, but I do know that it's such a deep-seated uh, concept within journalism that timeliness is this, is not quite essential, but just barely short of absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. Well, if you think of it as the shock value of the new, if the timeliness, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a huge asset. It's a huge storytelling asset. If you knew how his story was going to end, you wouldn't have listened so attentively, I mean, at a most sort of human level. But what do you think? Um, I mean, I, I can answer for us, which is that we, we don't worry about timeliness. That's, that's just not part of, of what we're concerned with. Again, we're concerned with how people conceive of themselves and, 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 and all of that. Um, given our lead times, you know, it, it's not even clear it's, it's helpful. Um, you know, we, couldn't, we hmm. couldn't put up a story immediately about something that was breaking or, or um, even all that recent. Um, more generally, you know, my, I, I have a very unnuanced view of this because I always thought of journalism meaning something that is fairly new. So um, obvious, that's obviously not strictly true, but um, so the, the way I always conceive of it is that, that again, we really do different things. Um, and I think, I think one thing that's, that's happened is that for a long time, um, really the only place and the only way to write about science and to get paid doing it is through journalism. Mm -hmm. um, that's still largely true. Um, and so what happens is you'll, you'll have people talking about science writing, the totality of science writing, and equating that to science journalism. And obviously there's enormous in overlap, but there's also room for other things. There's room for creative writing. Um, I know people now going through MFAs in nonfiction creative writing who are now doing science projects that are, that are fascinating. Um, and there is room for this, all these other avenues of writing um, that don't touch on timeliness at all um, and I think are really good to explore and, and add to our repertoire of how we, how we approach science subjects. Yes, um, I have two questions. So the first is um, how much do you know about who your audience is? Um, it seems to me that if a lot of, if, if your goal is in large part humanizing science and a lot of your audience is already mm -hmm. drawn to science or does science, um, that, you know, is kind of self preaching to the choir. Yep. And do you do anything to actively reach a larger non-science audience? Yep. Um, and then the second question is, um, you and the moth rebroadcast stories as purely audio pieces and I'm Wondering, if, have you ever thought about doing a video yes, in, in the style of a TED Talk? Yes, um, so, so the first question, um, what we know is limited to who I happen to know in the audience, and that's a terrible sample, so we probably shouldn't make much of that. Um, uh, we did, I, I happened to have an occasion at a um, show a few months ago to ask people to applaud if they were scientists and if they weren't. And it, in as much as you can tell from applause, which is, eh, um, it was about half and half, which was kind of cool. And that actually goes well with the, what we do know about is we did a, um, a voluntary poll of our podcast listeners. And we got, a, we got a reasonable response rate for those things, which is tiny. Um, and that was similar. I think we found that about 50% of the people self-identified as having a strong interest in science. And the rest, um, we had a gradation of answers, um, one of which was like, I'm okay with science. We had a lot of those. We had a few who were like, I'm meh on science. And then our last one was the, uh, I actively dislike science or something to that effect. Not a lot of people said that, but it wasn't zero, um, hmm. which was kind of nice. Um, beyond that, our audience is, uh, I'm gonna say unfortunately, um, extremely educated. The, the numbers of, of people with advanced degrees was sort of off the charts. 
Um, that's something we need to work on. Um, but so, okay, so about half and half, which actually isn't bad. Like, I'm, that, I'm okay with that since, again, our, our, we try to reach both communities, and so that's, that's good. Um, do we try to, try to get to them? Um, in, yes, um, there's always more things we can be doing. Um, for the moment, what we've been, been looking at doing is getting ourselves broadcast on platforms that go to other um, people. So uh, the best example of this was we, got, we did a show with Studio 360. Um, which is wonderful, and they have you know this super NPR audience, obviously, um, but they don't tend to attract the sciencey people, and so um, that was a nice one. Um, and we, we're working on similar projects like that. Um, we have a thing coming up with a, getting us on a sort of a comedy channel, which is kind of nice, um, and that again will will get us to to a slightly different audience. Um, but that is actually on our docket of I have our list of big goals, and um, expanding that direction is is one of the ones that we're coming up on. Um, video. Video. I, what are wrong, what's wrong with moving pictures? Yes. I hear people like them. They're good. Um, they even have talkies now, which are talkies, wonderful. Talkies, yeah, um, talkies. We've tried. It didn't go so well. Um, the moth tries as well, and it also doesn't go so well. And it's a really fascinating to think about why. lights kill intimacy, or? I don't think it's the lights. So it's, um, you, it, you actually don't have to light it all that different. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you can look, we, we haven't published that much, so you, you can't learn a lot from that, but um, The Moth does this. They publish on NPR and on their podcast, and they also video every show and upload to YouTube the same stories. Hmm. So it's actually a really good test case. And the numbers work out something like, and this is all public, um, so the, the NPR, they're reaching millions, tens of millions, I forget. Um, their podcast is up to something like 400-ish thousand downloads per episode. Um, and the videos, with one exception, the very most they ever get is about 50,000. Um, hmm. And usually it's a lot less. So their videos just do not do well. Um, why, I'm not sure, but I think it does have to do with the fact that um, whereas video is good, it's just not visual. There's, there's not a lot going on. It's one person on a stage. It's very different than a TED Talk, where the, the stage has intentionally been designed with all kinds of color and all kinds of things, and the slides you can cut in. And so you sort of have to, you know, mm -hmm. TED is the opposite. TED has the radio hour, which is actually doing pretty well. Um, they, they had for years, nobody knows this, they had an audio podcast that you could download, uh, which nobody did, because mm -hmm. why would you just listen to a TED Talk instead of watching the slides? Um, but also, there, there is this, this thing about radio, and it's sort of a, a known fact about radio that what, what it's mm -hmm. really good at is creating the sense of intimacy, yeah. right? And this is, this is the driving force behind why This American Life works, is you've, you know, you've got these people telling these stories right in your head, and the fact that you're having to use your imagination to, to envisage these people and the situations they're describing um, really works for that kind of personal story. Um, and so I think, I think the answer is, it, this, this format, this particular format, really does work better as pure audio if you aren't in the room with the person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've done, over the last four years, 75 shows. Yeah. Uh, 350 people or so mm -hmm. have told their story, including you. Mm -hmm. What's the one story of those 350 science epiphanies that you've brought out that sticks in your head? The one? Um, they are all my babies. Uh, I can tell you the one that I consistently use in as, an, as an example, because it really stuck with me at the time. Um, there have been, okay, I'll tell you two. Can, can we bargain on this? All right. Um, so, so the two stories that have really stuck out, um, one is, is by a guy named uh, David Carmel, um, and he's a neuroscientist. Mm -hmm. uh, he fell in love with the brain, in particular what goes wrong. So he's re he grew up reading Oliver Sacks books, right? And it's all these fascinating things about some, you have a stroke, your brain is damaged, and that teaches you all these amazing things about the brain. So he falls in love with that, becomes a neuroscientist, is working at NYU, and then his dad has a stroke. And he survives, he gets home from the hospital, David flies out to help take care of uh, him because he's the brain guy and because he's the son. Um, 
and his dad develops one of the most bizarre symptoms David has ever seen, where he starts believing that, so, so in, in the brain there's this map of where the, your limbs are, and something, somehow the lesion was near there, and his dad starts believing that his hip is attached here to his shoulder, and his legs kind of come up around his head, and it's very bizarre setup. He can see himself in the mirror, but still the, the mapping is messed up where he feels that his body is in this very strange place. And so David looks at this he's, and hears his dad describe this and is, is thinking, this is horrible. You know, my dad has this terrible condition that's really screwing with him. On the other hand, this is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> like, like, oh my God. And he want, he's like, I could write a case study about this. This would be a brilliant case study. Um, and, and he tells this story about the, the sort of tension of, you know, do I approach this as the scientist who thinks this is the coolest thing ever or the son taking care of his father? Uh, that, one, that one really resonated um, in part because, you know, you have this really in tight emotional connection um, of him with his dad. And I, I left out a lot of the more personal details that are harder for me to relay. Um, and then also just the, the this real experience of what it's like being a scientist confronted with this. And because it did an excellent job of getting across one science thing. You know, you're talking about education. He does this 40 second bit about the homunculus, which is the, that mapping part. And I guarantee everyone who's listened to that story knows what a homunculus is and carries that with them. It was this tiny part, it was like a 14 minute story, 40 seconds on the science. And that was a brilliant and perfect way of, of delivering it. Um, the other one that really sticks with me is a story that if anyone else had pitched this to me, I would have, would have just turned it down. Um, it's a woman named Christine Gentry. Um, she is getting her PhD in narrative, um, and I have seen her, and she's brilliant, and that's why I let her talk me into this. Um, but what she did, the show was, the theme of the show was animals, and what she decided to talk about was her dad's relationship to animals, and she wanted to do it as, instead of one story as a series of ten vignettes. And I'd never seen anybody do this on stage. It sounds like the worst idea ever, because it's gonna be this disconnected set of things. But somehow, I'd go listen to it. It's hard to describe exactly why it worked, but she managed to, through the series of vignettes, put together the most beautiful arc I've seen on stage. Um, it's a gorgeous story. So that's, an, that's a good example of saying, you know, are, are we gonna get too formulaic, not if people like Christine keep coming to us? Um, that one was, was brilliant, an example of what you can do when you expand a little bit the ideas of what you're trying to do. So you have a show tomorrow night? We have a show tomorrow night. On the theme of Human Plus? Human Plus. Where is this taking place? I-Beam, which is uh, up in Chelsea. It's an art and technology center, 21st and 11th. And will there be heavy drinking? Yes, always. <laughs> I want to thank you very, very much. Oh, thank you. For your performance and for the conversation that you've shared with us. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>